Hi, everybody. Okay, so welcome. Um, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Uh, Victor Thompson. He's going to greet us here on behalf of LA County. And we have quite a few uh, presentations today that we're going to be going through. And I welcome you all to our first chair meeting in our 2018-2019 school year. So without further ado, Dr. Thompson. Hello. Yeah, good morning, everyone. It's certainly my honor to be with you today. Um, as some of you know I had a few health problems here a few months ago, and um, I just wanted to report that I've been back to work about six to seven weeks. Um, I did have a stroke. It was on May the 10th. Um, it's very interesting because I'd never really been in a hospital before. It was my first time. I, I don't recommend that, but uh, sometimes you have to. But I think the thing that I learned, my doctor said, well, you've always taken care of your health and you've exercised and, you know, you, so I think that's really what helped you in your recovery. So the other thing that I learned from this experience was, um, some of you know I'm a musician and um, music is really an excellent way to recover from a stroke. It brings your language back and... Um, it's funny because I speak Spanish as a second language, but I really couldn't speak. It, it took me about a month or so to get it back. I, so I just played a lot of nice songs in Spanish on my ukulele, and <laughs> then it came back. Um, I had the opportunity to entertain some stroke victims, and I played the ukulele for them, and I, they just couldn't believe that I had recovered so quickly. But I want you to know I have some wonderful people here at LACO that check on me all the time, every hour on the hour. They say, you all right? I say, why? why? I look bad or something? <laughs> <laughs> but they do check in. And um, But again, thanks to everybody for your support during this time. I think the other thing that I learned is how important our loved ones are, how important our family is. And these are the things that I learned. Um, I also learned staying at home for two months that uh, the cats don't say too much. They just kind of give you a dumb human look. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, Marion's going to explain a little later. We have a survey for you to um, review. And basically, this survey is asking you to share your experiences, your best practices related to attendance and the improvement of attendance and chronic absenteeism. Last night, um, the LA County Board of Education did pass a resolution to recognize your efforts in improving attendance throughout LA County. Of course, they had me come to the mic and they said, well, what is this all about? <laughs> I said, well, um, I'm going to meet with some fine SARP chair persons tomorrow and we're going to talk about all the wonderful things that they do related to the improvement of attendance. As you know now, we're featured on the, uh, on the California dashboard. And it's very interesting because I think I've waited 30 years for this to come, <laughs> to be recognized at the table. So this is indeed a wonderful opportunity for us in this field of school attendance. Um, I've been serving on some of the differentiated assistance teams with some of the districts. And our goal is so that none of you are in differentiated assistance related to attendance. That's our goal for all of you, okay? But I've been to some of the school districts, and they asked me, oh, are you new to LACO? They'd never seen me before. <laughs> because usually our curriculum people and others related to program improvement would come out. I said, well, no, I've been at LACO 15 years now. Oh, okay. But friends, that is our goal. So as you do the survey, Please share with us your best practices, all the things that you do well. Um, we have launched on social media, we have a new Facebook and Twitter site that we are developing. Because my goal is, hey, here in LA County, we know what to do. And we're going to share it with the world. We're going to share all the good things that you're doing. And then Mary and I was thinking we can put all these best practices in our book. So we're going to get all of you in our book so that the world will know that we know what to do here in L.A. County when it comes to improving student attendance. But again, we thank you for coming. We thank our part partners from the DA's office, from DCFS, and all of our agencies. And believe me, it's great to be back. So thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Thompson. So this morning, I just wanted to remind you all that we have everything that you're going to be receiving today is going to be available on the Dropbox, as well as some paper copies. We're trying to save on our paper and save the world, one child at a time, one tree at a time. So as we look forward through our schedule, and you should have an agenda in front of you, you're going to hear from some providers that are going to help because we have small school districts and larger school districts. And that's the reason we're also opening up the online opportunity to see us without having to drive in. When Dr. Thompson said, who are you? You know, the question that comes up is, what are we doing? And also, what do we have available? I was surprised by one of our smaller districts that we went up to visit who said it takes us three hours to get there for a three hour meeting and maybe two and a half to three hours to get back home again. I can't do that since I wear the hat of superintendent, principal, CWA, all of those. So we recognize also that smaller districts require outside sources to be of assistance. We're going to be highlighting some and what we do as we continue each of our chairperson's meetings is we're going to give you a refresher of who's available to you for alternate school options, for support options, and also who's available to you for the needs of um, boots on the ground that we can't do for you, but we can get you connected, okay? So this is a, a just a quick campaign. I rise, I attend, I matter. LAUSD is using that as their attendance campaign. You'll also see on our agenda today, be here, get there. You have to have, because it's a local area, a means to communicate with your community. Every community is unique. And so given that, we're going to help you get your programs underway. But for the LEAs, each of the districts, each of the charters that can't go to deputy district attorneys, but are still a public school site, need to have students in their seats to get the job done. Here's something I saw on Facebook. Young kid banging on the door, and I wake up like, what? I open it up, what's up, little homie? Okay, now I'm not an a older black man, but this guy was really kind of cute. He says, uh, I've never seen this kid before. He said, I missed the bus, and no one will take me to school. I'm knocked on three doors, and my response was, say no more, fam. Didn't even brush my teeth. Okay, so he had dragon breath, but that's okay. He says, I grabbed my keys, slipped on my foams, Go get that education, young brother. <laughs> I just thought it was just like Facebook. I'm seeing education out there everywhere. Our community is online. And that's how we're communicating with each other. So like Dr. Thompson said, we added other things to our opportunity to get the message out as well. But I just thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Never met the kid before, but he got him to school. Thank you. So today's meeting on our agenda today, like I said, we have our best practices, and we're going to highlight some of our districts and some of their practices of what they have to offer. So you'll see uh, Downey Unified. Glendora, actually Glendora ended up uh, giving me the duty to present on their behalf because they also have the fair and it's Glendora Day. So what are we but flexible with SARB? Uh, then we've got uh, uh, Walnut Valley and Hawthorne School District. Our new program that we haven't seen before is for Eric Moore's Educate California Life Prep Academy, and so we're going to hear from him and his program. And then we also have a programs that we've heard from before, so I will introduce those to you, uh, and I'm going to give them each an opportunity to have a highlight, but we're also going to have a break time for you to visit with them in person. And again, if you're not here in person, then you'll be able to pick up their documents that we'll scan in on the uh, Dropbox. So let's go remind ourselves of the red, yellow, and green. What we've seen for some districts, uh, Azusa, I know that you've done this, they've taken these and they've used them as door hangers when they go out to visit. And they'll actually circle one of these and they'll say, we came to visit you today looking for your student. They're missed, we want them to be here. Uh, we want to let them know that yes, like anything else, green light is go, yellow is a warning sign, and red, you're chronically out of school, that can be as simple as two days each month because it adds up over the months. 
So we want to communicate and have a same communication. Whatever your means is, that's your motto, and you're going to go to it repeatedly. What does it take to get children to school? We have family practices. We have social capital. Schools themselves, but we're not the only ones. We have community services. And so the multi-tasks that we're bringing our communities in with is what we're going to address when we sit down at the SARB meeting. But SARB is already two steps too late. The first step is the communication from teachers to home. The second step is communication at the SART level, or student support teams, bringing them in. Even before all that is a positive work environment, engagement, a place children want to be. For some of them, it's the only place that they can eat a meal for breakfast and at lunch. And yet we're finding, and I just attended a CalFresh attendance, that because of fear of immigration status and other issues, parents are not wanting to sign up for Medi-Cal, CalFresh. So we need to be a trusted individual that they speak with. We need to build our parent engagement in a means that they trust us, that we're not sharing information that's going to put their family in danger. We uh, originally had planned, again, here we go with flexibility, so watch the yoga moves. Uh, we originally had planned for a uh, fishbowl. Have you heard of a fishbowl? There you have a group in the middle, and then you're watching what the activity is. Uh, we were going to try a restorative circles. Uh, with Blaine Watson uh, and his superintendent called all principals in for today. And so we're going to couch that and move it toward February. Okay? But in looking at it, I want you to see why were we going to bring restorative circles in. The purpose is to address the issues. Now, if students have, and I'm going to introduce Vicente Bravo for other means of correction, because if students have suspensions or expulsions and then repeatedly have the same behaviors, whether it's bullying or anxiety, and they're not willing to come to school because they're dealing with social and emotional issues, we've got to address that. It's not all academics with school anymore. It hasn't been for a long time. But it's about meeting the student where they're at, giving them the supports they need to get them back into school every day and on time. I'm surprised that some of our smaller districts or some of the uh, distance didn't even know we had the ACT team. Never heard of it. And yet, Abolish Chronic Truancy has been around for years. But because they weren't able to attend and come to our meetings because of the distance, they're creating their own problems with attendance because they couldn't attend our meetings. It's, it's a little funny that way, because when you're looking at it, who can be here and who can't, even my own child, when you look at your children, and, I, and I, I said this at my last meeting, he was running late to school on the day of my SARB meeting. And I said, honey, you can't be late. I'm the SARB chairperson. <laughs> That's not allowed. <laughs> but bottom line is, it happens in every family to everybody with education, but then you add to that lower socioeconomic status issues. You add to that transportation issues. You add to that all the other things that get in the way. But if you add to it, I don't want to be there because when I get there, it's unsafe. It hurts me. I feel like I'm going to be hurt. Then you need to restore that trust that the child has in school and what's happening. And you're also, in, in the end, reducing suspensions and obviously reducing expulsions if you change that behavior. Mr. Bravo? Will you come talk to us briefly about suspension, expulsion, and other means of correction, and restorative practice and the value? Briefly, I know, I a uh, key word there, sir. Okay. Mr. Bravo is our Child Welfare and Attendance Project Director and uh, comedian extraordinaire. I just can't spell extraordinaire, so. Morning, everybody. Welcome back. Good to see some familiar faces. It means that most of you retained your jobs. That's a good sign. Good to see some new faces. It means that some of you were able to get through that interview process and get in here. Lucky you. <laughs> so a couple things is in the world of student attendance as it relates to, to student discipline is one of the key factors with the dashboard coming on board and um, the ADD kicks in and I just start picking stuff up. 
Um, oh, shoot, I forgot. I'm supposed to be over here, aren't I? I told you, throw things at me. All right, I can walk? I, oh, wow, this is good. Okay. Because usually when they stream these things, I'm horrible. Yes. So I'm right there at the camera. All right, we're back. So basically, when it comes to student attendance and student discipline, one of the key links that a lot of people are going to have to get used to now is that every time you suspend a child, you could be contributing, contributing to your chronic absenteeism rate. So you could be sliding from that lovely green and blue arena into that yellow, orange, or red arena. So you want to understand that some of you in your districts or other districts that we're aware of have had a history of every incident or certain incidents are automatically three days of suspension or five days of suspension. Keep in mind that you are now assisting yourself into leading your district or your school site into possible differentiated assistance. So this goes back to why we do what we do in terms of other means of correction and alternatives, why in-house suspension needs to be done correctly and done well, if it's done at all. Other means of correction, alternatives correction, also help us understand that you know, the, the notion of suspending a child for being truant or being, being absent is kind of counterintuitive, but there are still places where that happens. And so we have to stay aware of the fact that when a child is not doing well in terms of coming to school, being there on time, the response is not to go punitive and disciplinary on them. The response is to use all of those best practices that you and your colleagues here have practiced over the years, developed, you know, the use of our DA's office. So they are, they are not, they're, they're, they're like a hammer, but they're a nice hammer. They hit you sometimes, but it feels okay because you come back. You know, they're a good, they're a good stick. And the issue, too, comes back to when you have students who are missing school, there are times when some, we have to look at some of the systems that we have built into our schools to determine whether or not they're contributing to our students deciding not to come to our lovely learning institutions. We have to look all the way down deep into the classroom, what's going on with our teachers, what's going on with, with our very, the staff, the crux of what we do in education, to determine whether or not what is going on in those classrooms is that starting point to draw our kids in into an, a learning environment that is engaging, a learning en environment that is relative, a learning environment that is safe. So as we move forward and we're looking more and more, and, and as you know, we've always been in a world of accountability uh, for the last 10 years. And we were, before that, we had major accountability with the API and our test scores and everything. We've now switched over, and we see this. And legislatively, I've seen it too, but we are looking more so at the social emotional learning of our students. And student attendance is at the heart of that. Because a student not being in school can bring with it a myriad of reasons as to why they're not there. So the few times that they are there, if they happen to not be the most stellar student on the face of the earth, and we immediately jump to disciplining that student and sending him or her away, probably not the best solution in that realm. So we want to look to find out, again, the one thing that I've always espoused is the why. Why is the student not here? Why did he or she not come to the one place that we think is the best place for that student to be five days a week, if not six, to get the education they need? And then once we've got that why, look at the what. What are we doing, including restorative practices, including PBIS as an infrastructure to work with our adult staff, including looking at our current policies and procedures to determine if they are not indirectly or unknowingly contributing to our students deciding to be away rather than at our school. All right. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Marion. And uh, as always, we'll look forward to working with you this year. And uh, have a good one. So he's going to stand near me. All of those who are participating on the county SARB please come stand forward with me. We're going to introduce ourselves and what our duties are on County SARB. It's only just a very brief introduction, um, but I'm gonna have them come up and we're gonna actually play past the microphone. So my duty, do you know that game? Yeah. My duty, of course, is to work as the SARB chairperson. And so I bring together, yes, come on, you betcha, me too. 
my duty is to bring together a multidisciplinary team. You don't see all of us here today because we have, for example, Gina Gaston with probation, who's in a meeting today, but says, call her, text her, get a hold of her via FaceTime. She's happy to talk face-to-face -face if you want a face to talk to. So each person that calls me and says, I've got something with a military enrollment, I'll connect with Vicente, or there's some expulsion issues, I'll connect with Vicente. So like he shared, each of our roles is to contribute to the greater good of all the local counties. 80 school districts, 50 SARB panel boards, actually we're at 51 now, 51 because we created a new one that's branched off a little bit up in the Antelope Valley. Yeah, uh, we have uh, 30 different uh, representatives that are coming as chairpersons. So each of those come together with us uh, with our co-chairs, which we have 42 of. Those are the step-in vice chairs, although our vice is a smoking and drinking. We had to give that up for school. But um, it's probably a good thing. But that doesn't mean Friday night we don't end up feeling really stressed by the end of the day. So. Let's pass this on down. Let's see who each of our participants are. And then um, also you can request for us to come out to your groups and to share as well, individually or as a group. So my role is uh, because I'm the project director of the Child Welfare and Dependence Unit, I am a component of the SARB County Board to make sure that Marion has the assistance and uh, resources uh, available to her to make sure that you have the assistance and resources available to you. And homeless and foster youth are also under me. No, foster youth is no longer under me. They are their own giant unit. And so Dr. Rochelle Tuzard, they have done a magnificent job of expanding foster youth, EPS program, uh, educational passport system program. So if you're not familiar with that, definitely want to get to know that as well. Hi, I'm Christy Fry, and I'm with the district attorney's office. I'm the deputy in charge of the Abolish Chronic Truancy Program and the Truancy Mediation Program there. So we have hearing officers that go out to some of the schools in LA County uh, to do the ACT program. And then we also, um, my goal is to have a representative from the district attorney's office sit on each of the SARBs. Um, and then if all else fails and the, the student still isn't in school, then we have the Truancy Mediation Program. Hi, I'm Terry Gendro. I'm on SARB 20B, uh, recently retired from Bellflower Unified School District. I guess I'm other duties as assigned is what I really am here. I'm here to help you guys in any way that you need. If you need me to come out and observe your SARB, help you uh, set up your SARB, um, anything else that you need to do about best practices, that's why I'm here. And you can give me a call or you can email me and I'm available to you. Good morning, Jewel Forbes, Community Health and Safe Schools. We do everything dealing with um, trauma, suicide prevention, school-based mental health, violence prevention, gangs, health, anything in those areas. Um, in CBOs, we do a lot of partnership with community-based organizations and other county organizations. So if you need resources, if you need um, help establishing mental health at your school sites or expanding mental health and building capacity, then you would reach out to our division. It's myself and um, Susan Chides, and also PBIS is within our unit as well. Good morning, and I'm Will Cochran. I'm with the County Department of Children and Family Services. And I'm on the County SARB as the representative of the department. What we want to do is to be available to your district and to your programs. It's not always possible for us to have the DCFS representative on each one of your SARB panels or to be attending each one of your meetings. However, we can provide you a great deal of information and we want to be a support. So there is information available on how to contact us. I won't go into that right now, but it is available through Marion. My name is John Pearson. I'm the Director of Student Services in the Torrance Unified School District. Torrance is a big school district, 31 schools, so we have our own SARB, and uh, this is my fifth year in the position, so learned a lot in those five years, last years. So if you're getting started, let me know, and I can do my best to help support. Um, same here. My name is Maria Mejia, and I represent Azusa Unified School District. And I've been working with SAR for the last 20 years of my life. And currently, I'm chair, co-chair, and I'm the new member here on the team. So 
I would do the same, support each one of you, uh, willing to share any past experiences that have been great for our district to help reduce chronic um, truancy. So I'm here also to assist. Good morning. My name is Rafael Rubalgaba. I am one of the six SARB chairs with LAUSD. We have two here uh, with us here today. We have a total of six local districts. We break up our uh, LAUSD into those sections, uh, two in the valley, one in central, one in the west, one in the south, and one in the east. And I uh, just gave a orientation to our SARB panel. I do that every year, and I make sure they're trained to start the school year even before I hold my SARB hearings. So if you need any information on how to get that going or what to include, what topics, I can help you with that. And we've already started implementing um, restorative practices for the last several years. There's a separate department that handles that with Health and Human Services. But I also employ the restorative practices type of questioning at SARBs just to make it more fluid and get parents to cooperate. Thank you. So thank you, county members. We appreciate you coming up and sharing what we do from our LACO perspective. Noticing that they're not all LACO employees, we bring in those who are doing a great job. And when we have our SARB symposium in May, what we also do is bring in our districts of best practices to highlight how did they earn the model SARB award. So we're looking forward to more of those. I know a lot of folks are applying with that. Given model SARB awards also, you saw that Terry Gendro is here for uh, giving instruction on how to complete the model SARB applications and she'll walk you through it. Each of the districts that came in to work with her have succeeded, so there's a plus. Uh, it does not depend upon you being a K-8, a K-12, a Union High School district. They're using all different opportunities as long as we're grabbing as many multidisciplinary means to support our students. Okay, now, that's what we have to offer here. State SARB gives us our direction as a county SARB to disseminate it out to the local SARBs. Then at that point, the local SARBs, it's up to you and the districts to determine how do we best meet the chronic truancy, chronic absenteeism needs. So some districts are so small or so large that they split into six. Thank you, Ellie Unified, for being here. Appreciate it. To have three out of six of you folks here today in one day is really fabulous anyway. Appreciate it. So next I'm going to share with you some of the outside groups that can come in and can present to you. And right now we're going to do our refresher. And we have a new folks um, coming in from Florida as well. We've presented in the past for k12.org. We've talked about independent study. We've presented from um, an opportunity to work on our letters that are going out. We also have our groups that help with creating a support system through phone and best practices. So first, I'm going to introduce to you Randy Graham from Rawi. Randy's coming on up. They have the Truancy and Dropout Prevention System, K-12 Solutions. It, of course, is going to be meeting the needs of all of your students, but also families and engagement. Are you going to be doing a, an add-on? OK. So without further ado, here's Randy. Hi. Good, after, uh, good morning. Still waking up. Um, we're very happy to be here. I want you to uh, if you can just take a look at that and hand that down. You can kind of go through there. Uh, Rawi K-12, we have a program called Truancy and Dropout Prevention System. And we are providing a way to implement all of your best practices at the district. We can automate through our system all of your best practices. We work with your student information system uh, to set that up, transfer the data. We provide ways to uh, organize, to get letters out to students. We can also automate that process as well, where we send the letters out for you. Uh, we also have, and I only got a few minutes here, I know really quick, but we also have SARB actually built into our system. And uh, I wanted to share with you really quick here. I don't know, think I can get up on the screen, but you can also, while they're handing my phone around, we'll start here and you can hand that down. But if you'll notice here, you've got SARB actually built into an app. We've got home visits, SARB built. I know this is a SARB meeting based around SARB, but with we're already TDPS, uh, we're actually able to help you track and monitor uh, truancy, chronic absenteeism, 
uh, special ed, all your subgroups as well in the program that we do. And we're able to share with you that data. And basically what it does is it actually saves the district hundreds of hours. Right now, uh, if you have a system for SARB, uh, tracking data, pulling queries, uh, reports, everybody kind of knows what I'm talking about, the time it takes to get that data, that information, everything that we provide you in our system is 100% real time. So you'll have all your ADA, you'll have all your data, all your information as of close of business school yesterday without having to pull reports, run queries, all the stuff that you do on a daily basis and typically, and everyone, every district is different. So the way our system works is we actually customize to fit your system. So whatever your district thresholds are, uh, we'll actually customize the program to fit those district thresholds, but we're gonna automate all of your processes. For example, uh, your student clerks, your site clerks will know how many calls they have to make to get a hold of parents. You'll know how many letter ones, letter twos have to go out. It simplifies that process of putting all of them into one file. You can print them instantly. You can send them out. Three things happen when you send them out because everything that we offer is basically to-do list. So once you know that you have a, something to do, you, you uh, print them out, send them out, three things happen. They disappear off your to-do list, which is a good thing. Parents get an email when it comes to letters. And also a text telling the parents, because as we learned in a recent conference, that pretty much everybody has a phone. How many realize that? So not only are we communicating by getting a letter out, by sending an email out, but we're also texting as well using the technology that's available today to make sure parents understand their kids are missing school and they have to be contacted. So it's just a few ways that we're actually able to identify with parents. You can see through my phone. Uh, that's some of the data you'll get. Is it still up and running there? Where's my phone? All right. I'll let you guys just take the time to pass it around. But we are offering an opportunity. We, we'd love to come and present. And many, many of the districts here in L.A. County we have presented to and we're still talking with. So if you have an opportunity, we'd love to come and share with you the technology that we're providing school districts just to help you be organized, efficient, and to automate your process and make a bigger impact on students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. Now, like I said, this is not about advertisement. This is about what do you need? If you can't do it yourself, how do you get it done? So we have other folks that can get things done for you and help you. We can refer you to resources, and we'll give you a choice of multiple resources to look at. Now, he said letter one, letter two. You're going to hear more about that later when we hear back from our deputy district attorneys, because that's the law requirements. And in my frequently asked questions, what I get often is, do I have to put in that driving part to our elementary students? And the answer is? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Handing it off to DA. Yes, it has to be there. We had complaints. Uh, Palos Verdes sent me a note saying we had complaints. They don't want to see that they could possibly have prosecution, that they could possibly have their license removed. Well. We don't want that letter to be the first time they're hearing it, but if those eight required notices are in place, then those eight required notices have been given prior to, just like any other change of rule with our new ed codes. Any changes, annual notifications lets them know prior to starting the school year what's going on. Now, if you have a student that is refusing to come to school, and later we'll hear about the no-shows and child find and what have you. They're refusing to come to school and you're working them back in, but you need them educated in the meantime. If they're in a treatment program, a home and hospital program, you may have that managed there. But if the parents just can't get them out of the house, we're gonna work on parenting skills, okay? But we don't fix it in a day. And we're gonna work on alternate programs. We've shared with you k12.com. I always said .org and they, people couldn't find it. Uh, right now, I'm going to share with you uh, FLVS, and they're actually in Florida, hence the F, uh, but they have a program that is available for students if they won't come into school to be educated while we're working on their social and emotional and restoring them back to your school site. Okay? The intent is not to keep them out forever, but what do we do while they're not available to us? So Christy Clue, thank you. 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, Marion said we are from Florida. I am not from Florida. I'm from Southern California, but it took me just about as long to get here because I, I'm, I'm in Thousand Oaks. So i uh, been up a lot of hours this morning, as probably many of you have. So I'm from Florida Virtual School, FLVS, and uh, we started about 21 years ago with uh, creating online courses. We're an online public school district in Florida, and we are the only online public school district in Florida. In Florida, uh, any students in any you know, public environment can take our courses online for free and have them count towards their graduation credits. And so in Florida, um, many students are graduating from high school with uh, an AA degree and their diploma. So it's super exciting for a lot of those parents you know, uh, saving some money on college, et cetera. So we've been around again since 1997. Uh, we have really written our courses originally in Florida when we uh, started offering our courses throughout the rest of the country and internationally, we actually design our courses per state curriculum. So as you guys know, with California, we have some unique um, deviations from national uh, common core standards. So we have our own California specific courses. We have over 170 UC and NCAA approved courses to offer as well. Uh, the difference between our curriculum and some other online uh, curriculum providers is that we have our own students. We have 400,000 of our own students in Florida. It matters to us how well our students do on the curriculum. And we design our courses with a lot of teacher touch in mind. We do not want our kids just clicking, watching a video, clicking, taking a quiz. So we have lots of different types of assessments, uh, discussion-based assessments, auto-graded, teacher-graded projects, collaborative assignments as well. We really expect our students that are using our curriculum to learn. So um, let me see what else I want to say. We are not for profit, so that's something that distinguishes us um, from other vendors as well. And we serve students that are wanting to accelerate, take AP courses. We serve students uh, with our credit recovery courses as well, and we have middle school through high school courses. So we're a great alternative if you have students who are bullied, who have anxiety, who have some things that are happening that are preventing them to come from coming to school consistently. They can take our online courses while they're out, as Marion said, but they can also continue taking them as part of their schedule in a traditional high school setting as well. Thank you very much. I'd love to have you guys come back and visit our table. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from SINA. Now, they will be our February 30-minute presentation from SINA, and it's one of the, uh, LACO uses the uh, A to A, atten uh, Attention to Attendance program. And so what we're going to do is we're going to let her do her spiel. <laughs> she likes the word spiel. And then what we're also going to do is take a break so that you can go visit with the tables afterwards. Um, and then we'll come back after this. So please, don't walk away. Listen carefully. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Erica Peterson, and I'm with School Innovations and Achievement, or SINA. I'd also like to take a, a quick minute. Um, so if you're not familiar with SINA, we work with districts on a lot of areas. And one of them, our sort of flagship, if you will, of what we do is the program called the Achievement Initiative. So I'll take a moment or two and tell you about that. But I also want to introduce my colleague, Pete Alcan. I've been with SINA for 15 years, so I might look familiar to some of you on the video and in the room. But Pete, uh, so with 15 years, I call that 102 years in SINA years. Um, Pete's only been with us in one SINA year. He's new to the uh, area, and he's our local rep um, to LA County. And so we'd welcome an opportunity to visit with you not only today, but also afterwards, if you'd love, to, uh, we'd love to come out to your district and maybe talk about what a partnership could look like in supporting the work that you're doing with SARB. But I want to take a minute and um, tell you a little bit about what we do with the Achievement Initiative. It, and attention to attendance is that foundation piece to the Achievement Initiative. So if you're familiar with that, it's sort of how we springboard. The objective with the Achievement Initiative is we're really focused on culture. We know that creating a welcoming and an open environment is what gets kids to school. So our message and where we support districts is around creating a culture of achievement starting by creating a culture of showing up. And showing up is sort of our mantra, our battle cry, um, our mission statement. And so then we work relentlessly in partnering with you to support you to those efforts because SARB is not right our destination or our end goal. We really don't want kids to go to SARB. And so what we really do with the Achievement Initiative is it's really a large-scale 
initiative where we put in a plan of continuous improvement. We work with you to partner on a three-year goal of different targeted strategies and solutions because we don't we recognize that one size does not fit all. And how we communicate to a kinder or first grade family is got, has to be different than how we communicate and outreach to, say, a high school student and their parents. And so we have targeted strategies or campaigns through the Achievement Initiative that help us both from a prevention as well as an intervention standpoint. Because again, SARB is there as that mechanism, and it's sort of our fail safe. But we want to make sure that we're doing all the right things beforehand to try to keep the numbers for SARB as low as possible. And so we have attention to attendance. It's sort of that engine in the car, if you will. It's an early warning and intervention system that sits onto your SIS and serves up the attendance data so that we can know what the resp right responses are, again, from a, a prevention as well as intervention standpoint. So we all know the prescriptives on the letters, first three unexcused days, first letter goes out. A2A takes care of all of that for you. But what really excites me is really then looking at the data. Who are our kids that are hitting those thresholds and why? And that's part of what we then do is start tackling and going after those different parts of your population so that we're getting all kids back to school, so that we know what the patterns and trends are. Are school sites doing SARTs and how effectively? So we do data outcome measurements that are letting you know then what schools are doing SARTs, how effective those SARTs are, so that we can start having conversations. We become an extension of your team. You're actually assigned an SINA service team um, and when you partner with us. And then we come out throughout the year and have those kinds of conversations, looking at what are the patterns and trends telling us, where are we having successes, and where do we need to continue the focus. So again, we'd welcome an opportunity for you to come to the table, um, get some information, and if we can have conversations with you about what your plan would look like, we welcome that opportunity. Thank you so much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you back. Thank you. I hope you had a great time at the break. Uh, get to visit with our, our vendors that are here and available to you. Um, I just wanted to make one quick announcement before we move on. The October 5th area meeting was misprinted on my older version, October uh, 12th. So this paper that I had at the table you're going to get a replacement one. It's the one that looks like the one on the screen. Of course, it's too tiny a print. It's not for the purpose of reading. It's just a visual. That gives us all of our meetings for school attendance review board, area meetings. Um, CHSS has their own sets. And of course, each district has their own PBIS uh, schedules. This one that you picked up, if you picked it up this morning, please trade it out for the one with the correct date. If you signed up for it on OMS, it's going to take you to the correct date, and give you a reminder as well. For those of you who are here and seated and had to write your name in, you'll also notice that there's an HTTPS code link that gets you registered and guarantees you a seat. So if you came in and you said, gosh, where are all the chairs? It's because we anticipated about half of the folks that came. And so you'll want to sign in on OMS. For the programs that are for a fee, you'll see those in orange background, very light orange, 1022. Um, that's our SARB in-person training. It's for the initial training or for those who prefer the in-person training opportunities. Um, then if you see the attendance supervision SARB symposium, that is for not this crowd. It's not for SARB chairpersons. It's to send the people who don't get it still. You've gone all the way through the school year until May and they're still not getting it. They're not supporting you. They're not helping you get the message out. They're looking at SARB as, when are they going to send it to the DA and punish these people? OK, you're not getting it. Let's send you in and let you have a little bit more education on what is SARB all about. And of course, then we also have our highlight reels that are lovely and wonderful tech team pulls together. It's called, uh, what do we call those? SARB, what is it? The turnaround awards, but what do you call them? The SARB videos. We, we call them success stories, bottom line. And so our students that earn the SARB awards, we bring them into our studio, film them, and have the success stories there and available for sharing back out again. Each case is unique. OK. So in each case is unique, as well as each district, of course, is unique. 
And given that, we have some best practices to highlight that we're going to share with you today. Uh, the first one is going to be with Hiro Roman from Downey Unified School District, who I'm not sure if Marian Reynolds is joining you. I don't see her today yet. But Hiro is going to come and talk to you about some of the things that he did in changing his attendance policies. And so I'm going to hand the microphone over to him. Come on, walk a little faster, my dear. I can only stall so much. Um, he's going to share with you how they went about making changes and why. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, this is a little intimidating considering I'm already my third year in student services. And all this experience here, obviously, you guys know a little bit more than I do. So I'll do my very best to share what we did in Downey Unified. Well, we didn't do much. We kind of stole it from Orange County. And if they stole it from the, you guys, then I do apologize for that. Um, some little district in Orange County uh, gave us this idea of starting to put a cap on the number of absences that kids have. So we created an attendance committee uh, that was comprised of uh, counselors, vice principals, assistant principals, principals, and my director and myself. And we sat down maybe five, six times throughout my first year, two years ago, and we started brainstorming, looking at our data, looking at surrounding data. And what we did was create this new policy that emphasized on having seven absences that are free absences, if you will. Uh, they will go ahead and come, and parents can call them in or send in a doctor's note or kids can ditch. And at the end of the day, they get seven free absences. On the eighth absence, um, they are required to bring a doctor's note or a notice from a subpoena where the child has to be there, some kind of documentation that justifies the absence. They have 10 days to clear that absence with that uh, note. And if they, do, they don't clear it, then it go, becomes an unexcused absence on the permanent record. Um, and then we can start the SART and SAR process. That is the gist of our attendance policy. But the biggest thing that we did to make sure that we did it is review a lot of data, uh, reviewed a lot of different policies, and then eventually created one big policy that obviously was presented to our Board of Education, uh, was approved, and we rolled it out uh, this year. And the big rollout was a pretty daunting task. We had to make sure that we educated all of our school site administrators, principals, and uh, clerical staff, along with our teachers, our parents and students. How do we go about educating them on this? Well, it's been a busy summer and a lot of kinder orientations, a lot of middle school orientations that I've been attending and a lot of our administrators have been talking about. And we also put it in our local newspaper, the Downey Patriot, on our district website. Uh, we also have Facebook. Uh, we have a public relations officer who keeps uh, that up, and she was able to go ahead and post a lot of the different changes that we did with this attendance policy. But that is basically all, in a nutshell, what we did. And the whole goal, obviously, like every one of us in this room, is to lower chronic absenteeism. Any questions regarding our policy? No? Awesome. Yes. After the eighth absence, they're required to bring in a doctor's note. Um, what if they go a month or two without any absences and then the absences start again? Do you, do you allow them to start over? Do you give them a doctor's note? Or? Question. So actually this policy, this, this uh, it's, uh, it's, it's for one calendar, I mean, school year, I apologize, not calendar year, for one school year. And what's going to happen is automatically our student information system um, documents uh, the fact that the child has seventh absences. And it generates on the eighth absent, I mean, on the seventh absent, it generates that uh, a letter, a chronic absentee letter, and it's mailed out directly to, to the school. And the school was, is able to filter to see if this child you know, has an illness uh, that can be justified. So maybe we won't send that that notice because the school knows them better than our student information system, which obviously is just a computer. And if it is a, a justified uh, letter, then it gets mailed out. If it's not, it's sent back to our student information system or our office, Office of Student Services, and we, re <clears throat> excuse me, we remove that, uh, that uh, program 
from our student information system where the chronic absentee label is off. And then, of course, like beginning next year, the, it, everyone starts from here. Any other questions? Great. Thank you, everyone. Poor Hiro. Oh, is this a sweaty microphone now? No, not at all. Didn't mean to call you out on that. OK. So um, next would be Ann Keys, but like I said, with the LA Fair, it's Glendora Day. And of course, her district needs to be there. And so she's presenting. You have, if you came in person, if you didn't, you'll get it on your Dropbox. If you have the, we've drastically changed our policy packet. Now, from Glendora, what they did is they worked with CalPads and they worked with DataQuest. And of course, obviously, you're going to be looking at your data to see, are you making improvements or not? And when Hiro says you start over again each school year, this is at the beginning of the school year. What do you do when the kids don't show up, the no-shows? So their no-show policy matches how to market according to the CalPads. If you also notice, this isn't just a seven-page document that you hand out and say, OK, we're done. This, like what Hiro was saying, is you need to communicate it with your staff, your front office desk staff who are there to register the students. You're going to share it with your attendance keepers and your attendance clerks. And if you want to take it and run with it or make any changes according to your policies, you're going to bring this back to your uh, assistant soups who are looking at it. Because the no-show policy directions are that we are to have from state SARB direction at the end of 10 days, we need to hold a SARB meeting. OK, so I had a question. If I, let's say, uh, Sentinella Valley asked me this question. This was a good one. I have three high schools, and I have about 30 to 40 kids that don't show up at the beginning of the school year. So what do I do? I said, hold a group meeting. You're holding it. You're doing what you need to do to bring them together to understand the no-show means that you basically have dropped out of school at the high school level. If we don't know where you're going to a private school, to a charter school, to an online program, then we don't know. And at this point, we're going to invite you to this meeting. You can't do it until you give them an opportunity to share if there's something else that needs to be done. So a SARB meeting must be held before that ending. So the exit reasons and how to mark the exit on CalPads was uh, delineated in this chart. If that's helpful for you, because they went to all the work to going through it, please feel free to use that. Okay, so Martha is going to come talk to us about chronic truancy, habitual truancy. Um, so we've heard about chronic absenteeism, which is, of course, the excused and unexcused absences mixed together. But we've invited Martha in from Walnut Valley to talk to us about habitual truancy and also with the mandatory packets and conferences that are required. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. Good morning. The notification for the SARB conferences, as you know, that we have um, templates within the truancy toolbox to address the notification. But I had to check with Marion because we often have students who have chronic absenteeism, but there's, there wasn't a template in there. So with some direction from Marion, uh, I drafted one that would address it, and it meets the requirements as far as notifying the parent or guardian with written notice. That way, we're in compliance. And slight modification, just to include, instead of it stating truancy, that it is due to chronic absenteeism. The notification also states that we have met with the parent, that we were reminding them that we have already taken steps and exhausted all other steps at the site level to address the problem. Um, the updated SARB packet checklist is for the person making the referral and also for the persons on the SARB to be sure that all documentation is in the packet. That way we can see if it's an appropriate case for SARB. And the checklist um, was from the Truancy Toolbox also. I made just a few little changes just to include a few other items that I thought would be helpful. And Marion's going to have all of these in the Dropbox as well. The referral to the SARB, that's a form for the school site representative to complete. And it's somewhat of a checklist as well in that 
I added um, a space for the truancy notifications to be listed when it's truancy, or there's also another area that the school representative can check if it's a case for chronic absenteeism. And that way they can just be sure that all the documents that are required that should be there so that the SARB board has a complete picture of the um, case. It's, it's like a bird's eye view too because it does list the past attendance, the current attendance, if there are any siblings, if there are any health issues or, um, and other interventions as well. And then the notification of habitual truancy, um, that's the notice also that I had modified from the truancy toolbox. Um, there was a referral letter and also a separate truancy notification letter. So after checking with Lydia Bowden when she was overseeing the chronic truancy program, I had checked with her to see if we could just have one notification instead of one notice indicating to the parent that a referral had been made and a separate notification of the actual SARB conference. So that was okay. As long as the requirement of written notice of the date, time, and location for the notice had been given to the parent. And um, really, that's it. It's, um, any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martha. What she's sharing is that she streamlined it. You don't have to do it all separate. You do need to do your notifications more than one time. But you don't have to do everything separate. And you don't have to waste paper and ink. If you're looking at resources, how many of you did annual notifications online with the sign up paper only? OK, a few. So there's a way to go about following the guidelines, but not having to go through all that paper printing. And because we have the opportunity to share in a different kind of global world that we're living in today, why not use the resources we have available? Also, the email and the notifications as a follow-up, again, emails, letters, anything that's in print, please take the opportunity to share that out as a verbal reminder. Face-to-face -face if it can be, visiting at the door if it can be, if you're doing the home visits or the telephone call from the trusted individual from school. Next up, David Malchuk is going to talk to us. He has a unique situation with his um, K through 8 district. They feed into Sentinel Valley for high school. Um, but they have some deans that they're working with and some professional development training. So I wanted him to share that with you. Thanks, Marian. Good morning, everyone. Okay, um, the Hawthorne School District has kicked off uh, September Attendance Awareness Month by getting all call messages out to all of our students' families announcing that September is Attendance Awareness Month. And also, I have been able to schedule with our community outreach liaison, Jezebel Salas, uh, she and I going to every school site in the district twice, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, uh, approximately 8 a.m., 8.05, until about 8.30, 8.40, greeting parents as they're bringing their students onto our campuses, giving them uh, a very pertinent handout, grade level specific, as to how they can assist their children and us, in turn, with educating their children and getting them to school on time, uh, which is a big concern in Hawthorne, as well as making sure the kids are in school each day to combat uh, chronic absenteeism and truancy. We've also held initial ACT meetings at the majority of our elementary school sites. And at yesterday's administrator meeting, I reminded the site administrators the importance of not just one ACT meeting. Some schools held them over the summer, which was great in August before school started. We started very early this year, August 21st. But some schools um, already had their ACT meeting in August. But I reminded the site administrators, one isn't enough. Uh, we're very um, fortunate to have an excellent representative from the DA's office who does these meetings in conjunction with our uh, site counselors, myself if necessary, at the school sites. 
So I recommended another ACT meeting, perhaps uh, right before Christmas break, because that's a time when we see a lot of boys and girls uh, perhaps going on extended vacations over that time period and coming back a week or two after we were back in session in January. If December doesn't work, I suggested January, certainly uh, before February. So sometime in J December or January for a second. I also recommended a third act meeting, if at all possible, right around our spring break time, which is another time that we see a lot of uh, boys and girls and families take extended breaks, uh, come back a day or two or a week or two after we're back in session. And so we're, we're hitting this proactively. Um, I'm sorry, I have to refer them to my notes because we're doing quite a bit, really. Um, one thing that we're trying to do as well is open up better lines of communication at the school sites. Um, I have found out that uh, the front of the house doesn't always talk to the boots on the ground, to the classroom, teachers, to the counselors, to the deans, to the health clerks. So we're trying to open up better lines of communication, starting with the classroom teacher communicating with the school counselor, the campus security officer, if they feel something's not right with student attendance, or they see a, uh, a student missing a day here or there, or being pulled out early, or arriving tardy um, more than once or twice. So we're developing better lines of communication, and I do have something to share with you in a few minutes. Uh, and that's something that's going to be ongoing we're going to have office uh, staff meetings coming up uh, where we'll bring in the office staff and try to get them on the same page so that the school, from school to school to school, everyone's doing the same thing. So nothing's different in our district from site to site as far as attendance matters and concerns go. Um, as Marion said, to combat chronic absenteeism, we are very fortunate to have deans of students and school counselors assigned to each school site. The school deans do work directly with the students to address and halt student bullying concerns, which may affect school attendance, and we're finding that out too. Oftentimes parents will keep their children home, and we know nothing about it until maybe I get involved or the school counselor, and, oh, my child's getting bullied. Well, we can address that when we know about it. If we don't know about it, it's sort of a black hole and we, we're playing catch up. So our deans are instrumental with meeting with our students and uh, combating any allegations of bullying directly and forthrightly. Uh, the deans have attended district anti-bullying trainings and they teach class lessons using the anti-bullying skills they have learned. Also, the Hawthorne School District has uh, adopted the Oveus anti-bullying training uh, module for all staff members. So all staff members were trained with the Oveus um, program uh, just right before school uh, began, a few days before school began. It's a slow rollout. It's a, a, a progression that we're going to be rolling out in the upcoming months. And we have to do it correctly because uh, we don't want to scare parents or the community thinking, um, it's encouraging bullying or something like that because sometimes parents think that, that these programs may do that. But this is uh, the entire staff from classified through certificated have been trained in this and there will be ongoing trainings as well as we roll it out. Uh, the deans also meet regularly uh, with foster youth and homeless students and their parents or guardians to ensure barriers to school attendance are lessened and broken down so that this population attends school, not just on time, but that they're in their seats every day. And uh, meeting logs are kept and shared with myself, between myself and other administrators. And we have had trauma-informed practice trainings for all site administrators, uh, campus security, counselors, deans, special education staff, as well as certificated staff at many school sites. And this will be ongoing as well. And the trainings have been instrumental in high, uh, heightening staff awareness as to student and family trauma that may result in poor student attendance. 
School counselors work with students and families holding ACT and SART meetings and referring students to SARB as necessary. And I myself did, delivered a SART contract yesterday to uh, a child who attended one day and now has been absent 13 days, but I just got wind of it a couple days ago. There we go with the communication breakdown. But I went to the home myself, and even though the parent didn't sign the contract, she was left a copy of the contract so that that can be duly noted in the records and we can move forward from there. I am also happy to say, uh, let's see here, social worker interns, we uh, have brought them on through USC. They're located at the district's three middle schools and also assist in preventing student chronic absenteeism working one-on-one -on -one and in small groups with students, making students aware of the importance of excellent punctual school attendance. We uh, piloted this program last year and we're adjusting it a little bit this year through the assistance of Sentinel Valley um, High School District, who we feed into. And the interns have, you know, today's their official first day. so. That's a great thing that we're able to do. They come on Wednesdays. Uh, I think we have four or five this year. Uh, five. We have five. Uh, so they're primarily there on Wednesdays from like 9 to 1. I think one or two show up on Thursdays from 9 to 1. But uh, I'm fortunate to be able to have them in the SAR meetings as they're available if they're there on Thursday because we switched our SAR dates day this year from Wednesday to Thursday due to a conflict with rooms. So they're invited, see what the process is about, and it's part of their uh, professional learning and growth as well to, to learn this firsthand. So I feel it's beneficial for them to be able to partake in these meetings when they're available. At this point, does anyone have any questions for me at the moment? Okay. I would like to share something with all of you. And we call this from A to SARB. And I don't have it up on the PowerPoint, but I'll hand it out. Marian, thank you. Yeah, great. And it's a, it's a flow chart. And we make this readily available to our counselors, our deans, our front of house staff, And it's an easy, hopefully easy, reminder to those involved with student attendance, the, the procedures and processes to follow. Uh, this is the latest version. We are working on a revision once we uh, make sure everything is in place. So uh, we're signed up for a webinar with the state towards the end of this month to see what's going on with uh, new attendance practices, but you may find this um, useful in your district or in your job site, and you feel free to model it and perhaps implement it because it's an easy to follow flow chart. And the last box on the bottom gives uh, one, you know, one, two, three, four, what the front of house and school counselor and site need to be doing so that it doesn't come to me and the little guy or girl is up to 30 or 40 absences. And I, I you know, unless I'm in power school uh, several times a day or school net and uh, scanning around in there and finding out when kids are hitting certain numbers or having our uh, computer techs, you know, give me this information, at that point, it's, it's way out of control. And unfortunately, we did have to address a couple of these students with uh, high numbers, 30 plus, not a whole lot, two, three, but <laughs> we did have to address them. And uh, when it gets to that point, it's just that much harder to get the parent to buy in because then the excuses have piled up. Uh, the wall has been built and to get through to that and break through can sometimes be difficult. So I thank you for your time and the opportunity to share this morning. Thank you, David. David, I, I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one on TV, but 
Can you see what they're passing out here? Your son's poor grades are caused by a condition known as attendance deficit disorder. I think this brochure might help. Where'd he go? And they're giving him a citalin instead of Ritalin. Citalin, sit in and get yourself in their chair. Can't educate them if they're not in their chairs. Exactly. Thank you, David, for sharing with us. Each of our programs are so unique. All right, now, next up, I'm going to be sharing with you about Eric Moore, Life Prep Academy. I'm introducing you to him. He's going to be talking about parent engagement. He's actually a Long Beach or LA resident. He's attended in Long Beach schools. He's helped us here by giving us opportunities to educate our students and also to provide healthy hints on how to empowering the parents and the families. Student engagement is entirely the most helpful means of getting us into the classes. How do we get them engaged? Create an environment that's positive. So without further ado, Eric Moore. Good morning, everyone. Once again, my name is Eric Moore, and I am the founder and CEO of Educate California. We are a nonprofit organization here in Los Angeles, uh, actually in Culver City. And we serve families and schools and districts, nonprofit organizations, and folks all throughout the state of California. I started the program back in 1998 uh, because my son was struggling. And actually, before I go into details on him, I want to tell you a little bit of story about myself, actually. In the ninth grade, I decided, can't exactly tell you why I decided, but I decided that school wasn't for me. And so I decided on my own that I wasn't going to go to school for a few days. And that few days turned into three or four days, and then it turned into six or seven days. And then on the eighth day, I decided, well, actually, I do like some of my classes. So I decided just to go to the ones I liked. And I did that for about three or four more days. And after the second week, I got a call into the principal's office because I learned that two of my teachers had been having a conversation in the lunchroom. And one said, oh, I have this great student that was doing really well, but all of a sudden, he must be sick. And the other teacher said, well, wait a second, what's his name? They said, no, he's in my class. He's been in my class for the last few days. So I get a call to this principal's office, and of course, the principal lets me know that they they knew what was going on. And they asked me, so why did you do it? And strangely enough, I didn't have an answer. I didn't know why. I just, for whatever reason, that period of time was a rough time for me. So I decided to take some time off. Of course, that led to my mother being called and having to pay the price for that. But it was a great experience for me, I have to say. And that's one of the things when I was when, when Marion invited me to talk today, I said, wow, this is really something that's pertinent to what I'm doing now. Because uh, prior to 98, I was a financial planner with American Express. And in 1998, my son brought home a report card to change my whole life and his life and my career. So for the last 20 years, what I've been doing is actually working with parents to make sure that families understand the process of being more engaged with their children's education and how to motivate their students because that's what it took. When, we, when I went through that situation, my mother sat me down and she was very upset, of course, but then she asked me, what was going on? Why? Because she could see a change in my attitude, probably just those teenage years, I guess. I can't exactly tell you. It wasn't like I was being bullied or anything like that. I just didn't want to go for whatever reason. So we had this great conversation and she started explaining to me about how it was my responsibility to take advantage of what my future looked like and how, yes, she could be the one that would come down if she had to, but it was far more important for me as a student to be engaged and for me to understand why it was important for me. So now moving forward 20 years and now I run Educate California and what we do is we help those families learn the process of getting their students engaged and it motivated, quite frankly, because when I thought about why I didn't go, the real reason as I look back on it is because I wasn't motivated, I had no plan, I had no idea what I wanted to do, I, I just didn't know. And I uh, grew up in a single parent household, my mother worked you know, very hard, so it was hard for her to really go through, even though she was an educated woman, she didn't have the time and she didn't have the real knowledge. So my goal now is to help uh, families learn that process, and I work with several schools and school districts and charter schools and nonprofit groups and so forth. What we actually offer is called the Life Prep Academy. That is the resource guide that you have here. And um, I was very happy to see on the opening page that family engagement or 
family practices is very uh, important, number one, as a matter of fact, because that's what we do. And the resource guide that you have, just to give you a little bit of background, it was created back in 1974. It was created specifically because the counselors in Northern California and San Mateo specifically, they wanted to make sure that they had a way of having a parent-school partnership so that the counselors would be able to speak from one guide and the parents also would have that exact same guide. So that was the focus then. And it's really meant to help you get the parent involved so that they understand what the process is eighth, well, really seventh, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, all the way through into high school so that the student has a plan for life after high school. What we do is we do workshops all throughout the state to help train uh, counselors and also administrators. We do professional development trainings. We also do some phenomenal parent engagement workshops, very good for those that have LCAP goals, uh, specifically around parent outreach and so forth. And we also come in, we provide these resource books the resource guide, once again, it was created in San Mateo, then it came to LACO in the 90s. You, uh, some of those, some of you who remember Bob Tyra, Bob was the person that I learned about this resource from when I first started my nonprofit organization. And I uh, got to the point where I started buying these for our workshops and Bob said, hey, you're buying all these workshops, why don't you come and sit on our advisory board, which I did for several years until 2011, and that's when my company was asked to take over the resource and to start producing these. So we currently, produce these for schools all throughout the state. I was just uh, traveling for the last two weeks at the UC Counselor Conferences. Just got back yesterday from Fresno and the day before at Oakland and San Diego and Riverside, or Pasadena, I should say. But these guys are really very helpful for having your counselors have a tool that they can use with the student so the student knows that they're on track, they get them motivated, and they provide them a way where they can also engage those parents. So we're not gonna go through the whole book, but I, there's a few pages in here that I just wanted to show you very quickly about some of the things that we talk about in our workshops. Our, our workshops are typically either 90 minutes or three hours long. They can be on the weekday, they can be on the weekend, and uh, whatever is most convenient for folks. We also do webinars, and we can do it in many different ways to reach parents and make sure that they have an understanding of the process. So just, uh, I'm gonna touch on just a few pages while I have a, a little bit of time. Starting on page three, um, this was something that was very important for my eldest. So when I started the organization, my eldest son was at Crenshaw High School at the time. Uh, that's when I first learned about there were three counselors and 2,300 students. And that's when I learned that dad needed to be more involved. And when I sat down with him, because I was trying to figure out why he was not motivated, and he said, Dad, I hate school. There's something wrong with me. I don't, I'm not, you know, I, I, I read the book over and over and I'm not getting it. Is there something, I, you know, I think it's something wrong with me. So I sat down and we sat down and talked about learning styles. And that was the beginning of really seeing a change in him. When I explained to him what his learning style was and how I could help him with that by finding, in his case, he was a very kinesthetic child. So, you know, he would read the book over and over, wouldn't get it. He would listen to a presentation, still wouldn't get it. But when I took those two things and then partnered them with videos and engaging websites, his grades went through the roof, his attitude went through the roof. He literally went from being a student that every other day he didn't know if he wanted to go to school or not to being someone that was excited about going to school because he realized that it was just my learning style. I mean, literally, he went from a C student to a B student within probably six to eight months. I mean, it was, it was amazing just to see his attitude change. And then the next year in his 11th grade year, we really saw a major improvement. So one of the main things we talk about with families is to understand how to motivate your student using their learning style. On page four, it just talks about a planning, having a four-year plan making sure that a student goes into the middle school and high school years understanding that there are very specific things that they're gonna to need to do, and more importantly, how their parent or family member can help in that process. So we put that page in there so that they understand how to take the right classes and at what time, so that the parent can walk along with them, and more importantly, walk along with the counselor at the same time, so that they all are on the same page. Uh, flipping over, we're just going to skip on to page 13 real quickly because this is something also that I hear a lot from parents, uh, students with special needs. Um, I work with a lot of colleges, and I hear a lot of times that students will wait until their second year of college to even talk about special needs, or they may go through their entire high school career without letting someone know that they have a special need. A physical disability is clear that they can help them with that, but there are very specific things that you can do to help your student if they have a special need like dyslexia or ADD or something that's also 
motivating or actually demotivating them to, to go to school, if you will, because they are struggling when they really don't have to, when there are things that you can do to help your student succeed. So that's another page that we talk about very heavily. Um, the pages 15, 16, and 17 are a checklist that's very powerful for the student. Once again, for the student to know that they're on track and to understand that there's a very specific system that they should be following in order for them to reach their goals, and I say that very you know, distinctly, their goals, because a lot of times what I find is that the parent has instilled goals, the counselor may have instilled goals in the student, but a lot of times they're not, that's not you know, that's necessarily what the student's goals are. So we wanna make sure that the student understands how they can get themselves on track and how they can be reaching their goals in their time frame and walking them through with this checklist has been very powerful for the students just to know that they are actually working towards their goals. Another quick page I'll take a look at is on page 25. Uh, I work with a lot of students that are in foster and homeless, uh, foster care and in, are homeless, uh, especially the ones that are in high school and they're telling you, you know, they want to be independent. They want to know that since they don't necessarily have someone that's a caregiver that can be there to walk with them, that they want to be independent and know how to handle things for themselves. One thing that we talk a lot about is living away from home. Uh, one student, as a matter of fact, that I work with, is the name is Javon, Javon Wilkes. Uh, about eight years ago, I met him at a nonprofit organization. He was in uh, the 10th or 11th grade at that time. And he had been homeless and been in foster, uh, foster care. He, at that time, was actually living in a doorway in downtown Los Angeles. But he had uh, gotten into a fight at school because students were teasing him, the fact that he was homeless. So he had basically decided to drop out. But when he went to court, they, he was assigned to go to the Brazil Center. There's a nonprofit organization downtown called the Brazil Center. And he was asked to go there from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. And I just happened to come in and do a workshop for him. And I did a second workshop for it at the school. And that's when I learned that he wanted to go to Cal State uh, Channel Islands at the time. So he didn't have necessarily the grades, but he definitely had the attitude and the work ethic. And over a period of time of the fact I'm a special consultant with the CSU, and my organization works very heavily with the CSU, we were able to put him in touch with the right people so that he was able to get himself at uh, Cal State Channel Islands. Fast forward eight years, he's graduated, had graduated with honors, and he's back actually serving, uh, working for a nonprofit in San Francisco that serves non, uh, um, the homeless and foster youth. So the, it was just a matter of him becoming independent. We worked very clearly with him on what steps he could take to be independent and to reach his goals. And we've had uh, you know, several success stories like that. Um, another page that we like to talk about in the book is way back on page 53 here. On, I'm sorry, uh, page, yes, page 53. Page 53, I like to start very early with students and with their parents getting them on somewhat of a trajectory of the career plan that they may be looking at down the road. And page 54 also has some wonderful websites that we go over during our web, uh, workshop on how the parent can sit down, or parent or guardian or mentor, we work with a lot of mentor organizations also, how they can sit down with a student and help that student figure out what their strengths are. Very empowering for a middle and high school age student to understand what their strengths are, what their plans may be for the future, and these websites on page 54 are excellent for helping the student understand exactly what they need to do in order to achieve, once again, their goals. Okay, one other page I'd like to, or actually a couple other pages I'd like to show you here is page 50, I'm sorry. There it is, 62. A lot of the students that I'm working with, once again, being in foster and uh, foster care and homeless students, and just high school and those high school students, they are really wondering how they're going to uh, be able to sustain themselves and to be independent throughout their lives. One thing I really go over the, with them with them is how to make sure that they, when they are at the 13, 14, 15 year old level, and they're now starting about um, you know getting a work permit, going out and finding their first jobs, and those types of things is that there are very specific things for the interviews and for making sure that they are on track, their social media. We cover lots of different things like that in our workshop. How to make sure that they are social media ready, that they are interview ready. Uh, we talk about for young men and for young women some tips and so forth on how they can be independent and how they can be prepared and empowered to go out and find those jobs and to be able to sustain themselves into the future. Um, 
also on page 67, very important, um, about healthy living skills for students. Uh, once again, those students that I work with, they are dealing with you know, some situations that are not you know, the average situation. So we want to make sure that they know how to take care of themselves, how to use our resources, and also when to call us if they need us. But uh, pages 67 and the pages behind that talk about just being a healthy living person, tips for them to eat properly when they get into school and things like that and to be able to take care of themselves. One issue I hear a lot with colleges is that we have students that get onto the campus, they move into the dorms and they're eating hamburgers and pizza and french fries for the next two years. So we want to make sure that they have the skills once again to be able to be independent and take care of themselves and to uh, live on their own going into the future. So once again, our focus is to be a resource for you and to be a resource for those that are service providers that help students all throughout the state of California. And then, of course, to be able to deal directly with the families. We work directly with families and with students in many cases so that we can cover exactly what they need to know in order for them, uh, for the students to be empowered and go on to have a successful life after high school. But our resource guides, uh, once again, this was, it was uh, created by San Mateo, then brought to Lake O. This has a great history. It's been 44 years now that this has been used. So it's a wonderful resource guide. Uh, very inexpensive. The retail price is $11.95, but for any school or school district, it is only $1.95 for the resource guide. Okay? Uh, we are going to be doing another printing, as a matter of fact. That's uh, one of the reasons I've been going through all the counselor conferences. Our next printing is coming up in the next month or so. Uh, so if you are interested in learning more about the Life Club Academy, please just let me know. I'd be glad to come out and do a presentation or speak with you more about the guide and how it works. Uh, we can even schedule a seminar or a a brief workshop where you can see exactly how we deliver them. Uh, we are also, once again, available to do professional development trainings for new counselors. That's one of the newest things uh, that we're doing a lot. We've always done them for nonprofit organizations, but we've had a few schools that have asked us uh, to come in and work with their newer counselors to make sure that they have a complete understanding on how to use the resource with their students. Uh, it is available in English, Spanish, and there's a digital version. Uh, the digital version is absolutely phenomenal. It has hundreds of hyperlinks in there so that students can use them on their phones and their iPads or Chromebooks or whatever uh, tablets that they have. And uh, once again, it's just a very clear and concise program to make sure that the student, if it's given to the student, they can use it. If it's given to a parent, the parent and the student can use it. But we want to make sure that it's something that can be used independently by each student at the same time. Okay? Any questions that I can answer? Alrighty, not one question. Wow. Alrighty. Well, once again, I thank you so much. And if uh, my my information is on page one of your resource guide, if you need to reach out to me, please uh, go ahead and email or give me a call. And I thank you so much once again, Mary. And I look forward to seeing you all. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. You, he came highly recommended from Jewel Forbes. Of course, she's our counseling gal, so why not, right? But, uh, those of you that are not here today, didn't get to go through the pages with us, what we will do is we will ask uh, Eric to leave us a stack for the remaining uh, SARB members. And if you're interested, please drop us an email. Okay, it's not something we're going to make a scan and copy of, so don't worry about copyright issues. Thank you, sir. I'd like to go again to a quick review of our upcoming events here at LACO. Um, we have the SARB certification. Now, I had erroneously said everyone's required to be certified. Not true. But the new requirements from our assembly bills that are telling us that all supervisions, uh, supervisors of attendance have certain duties that they need to follow, and our chairpersons who are leading the chairs uh, as the group for SARB, we want them all to be on the same page. So that certification is highly desired by our SARB chairpersons primarily. And then we add on any other persons that may be stepping in as co-chairs and participants who are new to the SARB program that don't have an education on what it's all about. The three-year renewals can be done with our online modules, which have been updated with the new attendance supervisor training information. And so those are also available. The online finishes in October, I think, around the 7th, Elizabeth the 12th, she's giving me a cue, the 12th, uh, that gives us enough time to say, hey, you didn't finish, come on in in person, let's have you in anyway. We don't want to have it just as a drop. There used to be a renewal or a, um, a makeup session in January, but we found that that's a little too late. 
If you're already sitting on a THARP panel, you should have your training early on at the very beginning. You have your status hearings, hopefully right away, immediately. Don't wait for a need to start new SARB. Have your status hearings. How did the kids go? Because you have an, a school year for your attendance, but you have a calendar year for your SARB. So you want to make sure that within that 12 months, you've checked back with them, 30 day, 60 day, 90 day. How are we doing? How's your progress? How are you doing on holding up to your agreement? Um, Every Child Counts Symposium has at the Marriott an AXA event, and that's for special ed and student support services. So we're going to be there and presenting as well on chronic absenteeism, so I threw that up there for you as another event that's coming up. And finally, our symposium. The Attendance Supervision Symposium is for the purpose of meeting the needs of those folks who just don't know what they're doing with SARP or SART. Again, it's not for you. You all know what we're doing. You're disseminating the information. That's for the ones who are still by May not getting it, and you want them to start fresh the next year. We want to instill in them that this is a discipline of education. This is not an opportunity for punishment, but for taking down those walls that have been built up. Okay, I'm not going to go there. Then also for uh, the barriers that are getting in the way for the parents and for the students to have the regular attendance. One area that we've been weak in in our uh, surveys in the past have been parent engagement and services. So thank you, Eric, for being here today and helping us with one more resource that we can look to. In summary, uh, Assembly Bill 2815 were to raise awareness. And uh, that raising of awareness, how do we go about doing that? Now, this slide is not great for a slide sake, but it's a reminder. The law says, as supervisors of attendance, we can't go about handing out letters, calling them into meetings, without giving them an opportunity to know what are the expectations from the start. Hiro said the summertime they had those orientations. When the kids go from one school to the next, elementary school to middle school, if you have an opportunity for a meet the school, visit the campus, have a picnic, at that time, remind them what attendance is. And when you go from an elementary where you may be in one or maybe partner teacher two classrooms to six periods a day each class and have to go across a campus and meet with different individuals and walk in the outer, hopefully supervised borders of the classrooms, how to navigate your way through and make sure you're at each class and on time. And that's seated in your chair. And so that reminder is an opportunity for you to share with the parents the expectations, but also with the students in advance before they move on. When they go from middle school to high school, that's a chance to meet with the clubs. So you do it in the springtime, getting ready for the following year, because clubs give you belongingness. Clubs in high schools give you a place where you can be with people that are like you, that you feel comfortable with instead of being just another person on the campus and unmotivated or don't have something that you need to get to because why bother? The kids who live in the moment, the kids who are living with street trauma, who live with the moment for today, don't have a future, don't think about their forward. And so they're living with, well, I'll make it or I won't make it. Give them something to look forward to. And in doing that, highlights at the springtime for the following school year is a great way to do it. And not just that one shot, but then meetings with the principals, visually being available to be out on the campus, and making those phone calls, like I said, positive reinforcement. So when we identify and we respond, that means that we're identifying. And I can say that, uh, like, uh, you know, when, when Mr. Malchak was telling us about you know, you can't know anything until 13 days later. That's a little too late. Why was that communication missing? That's our duties to take back to our uh, attendance clerks. And that's why the symposium is important to say early on, you don't have a happy habit of a practice. You're not building up your, your happy habit of being out and about. And it's a means of catching them when they're there and reinforcing with them we need to be there every day and on time. Otherwise, these are the consequences. But better yet, if we identify it and address it early, we can nip it in the bud. Okay, evaluating the effectiveness, three words, data, 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 
or if you're from the East Coast, data, data, data. You're going to look at chronic absenteeism and the rates, the truancy and the rates, and that's going to be what's showing up on our dashboard now. Have we made improvements or not? Parents can't go get old API scores and say, hey, this is a high scoring school or a low scoring school. Now they've got all these other measures that we're looking at on the dashboard. And because chronic absenteeism is showing up, if they're not there, that's going to be one of the, the highlights that we're going to have to come out for technical assistance to help you with that. Conferencing, activities, recognition, and referral. The recognition cannot be only for um, the students that are doing really well. It can also be for those who are making improvements, much improved turnaround attendance. Uh, it can be for the staff or the classrooms and have it as a build by group for the teachers who are making those phone calls and making a difference in their own personal data. Why not break it down to the level of, you know, if you have perfect attendance and that's it, you miss one day, it's shot. But if you had poor attendance and then you can turn it around to something positive, let's recognize that. So we've got to go both avenues as well. SART and SARB and looking at I had, a, I had a young lady come up to me uh, from charter schools and said, you know what, even though we don't go past our SART and we don't go into our next level of deputy district attorney and all that, just all the SART practices have made a huge difference. It's at the school level and at the site level. So when we look at our interventions and our referrals, um, this is just a reminder that there's multi-levels of supports. And if you've got a campus that doesn't have a positive environment, you're going to need to look at your overall picture first. You can't look at all those individual students if you don't have it on a regular basis as a positive practice across the board. Remember, as a principal, I went from elementary to middle school, there's always that one teacher who's really cranky the cranky pants teacher, you know that one that should have retired or is in the wrong business. Okay, well that person is also causing some attendance issues or that's the one who makes more office referrals than anybody else. That calls for administrative intervention as well. It's not always the students. Sometimes it's the adults on campus. Keep that in mind because we've got to create an environment where the students are happy, productive, successful, and challenged. Our local SARB report we have, I'm not going to share with you our, our county SARB report, although I did give you our numbers. What you need to do at the local level is share your SARB report. You need to communicate that with your community. And your community is not just the folks at the office. It needs to be communicated with the parents. Why is this a problem? How is this reflected on lack of ADA, less instructional materials available for your students? Uh, lack of ADA, then the, the funding, of course, is there, but it's not all about the money. It's also about collaboration and units. If students are expected to work in groups and move forward, how are they going to work in groups if one of the students is always missing? You're missing out on the teamwork and the, and the opportunity for them to be uh, a part of a team. Tell them what your goals are. So it shouldn't be a secret. Share it immediately. Our goal is to improve our attendance for this. And if it's a specific group, why is it for that specific group? And how do you meet them? They're not going to come to you. Sometimes you have to go to them. So look at the community organizations that you're going to be meeting with and look at other opportunities outside of your realm. Status hearings, just like we have for our mandated reporters, we want to watch at our status hearings that there's not something at home that's happening that's causing us. And this is something that Will typically speaks to at our uh, certification. But some of the behaviors, some of the absences are to hide abuses. So make sure that we're staying on top of that as well. It may not be that the child wants to stay home. Maybe there's bruises the parents don't want you to see. So they're keeping them home. So that's just a gentle reminder. And now I'm going to bring Christy Frey up because at this point, Christy Frey. Oh, yes, ma'am.
neglectful supervision. So let's say that a parent after school, uh, say it again. Oh, the camera will come to me. Hey, camera, follow me. Um, the, the, the neglectful supervision is when a parent is not supervising a student into the point that they're creating a danger to themselves or others. So that's what we're talking about there. When a student is under the age of 10, let's say, and walking home and has to walk through uh, dangerous areas and doesn't have a partner, then what can we do to support that student? Safe pathways to and from school, walking school buses, those things. If it's not gonna be a transportation issue, if it's gonna be uh, students that are expected to get themselves out of bed and get to school in the morning, which we know a lot of our single parents and working parents may work double duty. And so are they being neglectful if they're not getting their child out and to school? No, it's not a neglect report to DCFS, but it is a means of perhaps giving them a collaboration or a connection with another parent in the neighborhood that they can partner with to get them to school. If there's a transportation issue, do they have a backup plan? Um, so the neglectful supervision is about neglect, lack of food, lack of clothing that's appropriate for the weather. You can't say a homeless person is a DCFS report. That's not true. They can't provide a roof over their house, but do they have a safe place for the child? And homelessness can be as simple as couch surfing or half of the family is living with one set of cousins and the other half is living with another set of cousins, doubled up in an apartment. So we have to look at neglect and supervision in a means of, is this within their control? Are they neglecting their parental duties or not? Does that answer your question? Okay, very good. Okay, back to Christy. So I'm just going to give like a five minute summary of um, what everyone should be doing. And then in the presentation in October, that's our big SARB certification and, and longer version of all of this. But I also wanted to talk about what we do in the district attorney's office for those of you who don't know about it. Um, we have the Abolish Chronic Truancy Program, which consists of six hearing officers that I have to go out to schools all throughout LA County. So those people are covering Antelope Valley, Long Beach, Pomona, everywhere. And so obviously we're not in every single school in LA County. Um, for example, I think with LAUSD now, we're in 47 schools um, that uh, have the ACT program. But what they do is they have ACT meetings or parent meetings where the hearing officers go out in the beginning of the school year and um, throughout the school year if necessary to explain the laws to big groups of parents. So the school will identify who the, the problem students are and they'll have a big group meeting where our hearing officers will come out and speak to the group of parents. They also will help out with SART meetings at the schools where we have the ACT program. So we'll have one of those hearing officers go in and sit in with the school administrator and the family individually to hold the SART meetings. And they also sit on SARBs. One of the things at the bottom of this slide is uh, please email me if you need a district attorney representative for your SARB or come up to me after the, this ends today because I want to have a DA representative on every SARB. Most of you uh, should have a returning person from last year on your SARB and you should be taken care of, but we're using some people that have a one-year juvenile rotation, so that means it switches every year. So if I need to get someone for you, please let me know, and, uh, and I will. Um, so that's the ACT program, and then after SARB, after everything's gone through, we have the truancy mediation program. So we have Jennifer Gowan here, um, who if anybody's ever brought a case to the DA's office, you've brought it to her. Um, and that's the cases where if we actually have to prosecute somebody because we've tried everything, everything, everything else, then we will. Um, I will say that, you know, we always feel like it's a failure if we're, if we're prosecuting someone. This isn't, because we're the DAs, we're not trying to, like, build up our caseload in court. It's actually, you know, we hope to have fewer and fewer cases coming to us because we're finding out what's happening with these kids and we're helping them and getting them in school, but obviously there's some, some you can't save them all. 
So um, sometimes we do have to prosecute parents. Sometimes we do take kids to juvenile court. One of the things that I should mention to you guys, which I don't even know if you know, there is a bill that is sitting on the governor's desk right now to repeal our ability to suspend driver's licenses. So uh, I know that's something that we talk about in SARB sometimes, you know, and I, in my Palos Verde SARB, I've, I've done that where, you know, the judge can actually take your driver's license privileges away. You wouldn't be able to drive. And I remember there was a girl who, who was 17 in Palos Verdes who was very upset at that possibility. And I honestly think it might have motivated her to start going more regularly to school again. Um, that's probably not going to be around anymore. It was passed by both, uh, both houses, and it's sitting on Jerry Brown's desk to sign. So if he signs it, then starting in, in 2019, we won't be able to tell them that we can take their driver's licenses away, which was really one of the only threats that we had for the kids, for the juveniles. For the, for the adults, we can, if they're really not taking their kids to school, and this happens with some of the elementary school age kids, we can even put them in jail and have if, if everything else fails. So we have some penalties for them. I have a 15-year-old son who said, really, you guys can't do much of anything to me if I want to start skipping school, right? He's going to Peninsula now. So, but, uh, so anyway, um, it's, they're making it harder and harder for us, but hopefully we can just help motivate these kids, like what you were talking about, and figure out ways to get them in school. Um, so basically, before you ever come to truancy mediation, before you ever bring a case to Jennifer, I actually have a checklist. I don't think I have enough copies for everybody, but anyone who's brought one has seen these checklists, um, and if anyone wants them, I, can, um, I do have some up here if you want to get it after the meeting. But basically, there's just certain things that you have to do before you bring a case to us. The um, letters that go out, the first notification goes out um, once there have been three unexcused absences. So that's the first letter that goes out. Then after that, if there's just one additional excused absence, that's the second letter that goes out. And then after that is if there is another, just one, unexcused absence, then a third truancy letter goes out. And then um, if you've already tried to hold a SART meeting, or actually held a SART meeting, then that student is declared a habitual truant. So those three letters should go out, um, and the whole time you're documenting everything you've done on the case, that's very important for us in the DA's office if we're eventually going to have to prosecute it. Um, there is a requirement that there be a SART meeting or at least a conscientious effort to hold a SART meeting. And um, after all of that, once the student has been declared a habitual truant, then it can be referred to SARB. Um, you know, we, we give these students a whole lot of chances and the success stories are very uh, inspiring and we have a lot of them and that's great, but um, if for whatever reason it just is not working, not working, then they can come in for truancy mediation with Jennifer Gowan, who's sitting here, and that's actually still another step. So even if you refer the case to the district attorney's office, that doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to prosecute it. They're going to come in and sit down, usually with the SARB chair, so one of you guys, um, and Jennifer, and just try to figure out what can we do? Is there anything we can do, or are we just taking you to court? Um, but that's, that's what we have to offer. Um, uh, you know, there was a, a Ventura County case that's out there right now that's before the Supreme Court, the California Supreme Court, which we don't have that many truancy cases out there. So as lawyers, that's kind of exciting. And basically, it's a case where in Ventura County, they took a kid to court that had not gone through the SAR process yet. And the public defender there is arguing that that was unfair, that they should have had the opportunity to go to SARB first. And basically, the lower courts have held it. There wasn't a requirement that they go to SARB first legally, but that is best practices. So that's what we do in LA County. It'll be interesting to see what the California Supreme Court says. But whether it's a legal requirement or not, it's our requirement that the student must go to SARB first before we would see a case in truancy mediation. Does anyone have any questions for me? No? OK, and like I said, come up to me. Oh, yes.
Right, right. So that will be that the law is still in effect till the end of 2018. But if the governor signs it, then we should not be advising people anymore that we can take their that the judge could take their driver's license or driving privileges away. Yeah. Okay. There's a question about work permits. Um, apparently, that issue has come up with him. Yeah, this issue comes up a lot in mediation. Um, if a student is 16 and is not going to school, you should not give them a work permit. That really is up to you. There's no legal policy. There's no, le there's no law in the book other than they have to be a certain age. But I believe as a school district, if they're not going to school, they really shouldn't be working because they will not go to school and they will go to work. So. Um, that's actually something you can hold over them, and it works, because I actually met with somebody yesterday, and he was very upset that he didn't, she revoked um, his, his permit, and he was very upset about it. We said, well, all you have to do is go to school. Then you can get it back. So, so, that, so yeah, there's no legal, but I believe that's a very powerful thing if a student wants it. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you. Well done, Christy. Last year was her first year. Yeah, so if you're a newbie out there, there's hope. Just remember that we in the school business are about compliance, not law enforcement. We need to comply with the law, and we need to help the parents and the folks that are not necessarily complying to understand that before we get to those next steps. Every opportunity to make change. Here's some questions that I want you to take into your core. This is the questions you bring back to your districts. Is our school a place where kids want to be? Without a positive environment, they don't want to be there. They're going to fight it. I, too, have a teenager. He's my number five son. So I don't know, baby of the family. Uh, not highly motivated, but I had a great experience at Torrance Schools to start, and then we moved here to Downey. And I have found the best class ever. It's called Personal Finance. My child learned how to write a check, and now he's doing a module where he had to get uh, driver's insurance how to pay for a car. What rental are you going to do? Are you going to choose the share a two bedroom or share a three bedroom? What deposit needs to be put down? Then it goes into daily living skills and food. You can't win at this module by not eating for two months. Uh, work. You have an opportunity to work in the uh, office or you can do some work at, uh, from afar. Internet and cable. If you're working from afar, do you have high, you know, high Wi-Fi or do you have slow go? Okay, uh, then phone service, cell phone service. Are you going to use the smartphone or are you going to use the pay per month? Okay, and then they give them a, a job. And I said, honey, you know, they're going through all of this and um, it tells you if you drop your phone on this program, you pay for a full phone. On this one, it's replaced with a used phone. Now, we as adults, we've, we've been adulting. Adulting is hard. It's a verb. Adulting is hard. But for our kids to do these things now and learn it step by step, I tell you, by the next day, my child appreciated so much more what we do for him at home. And I love that he's going to have to figure these things out on his own. But he's like, what does this mean? Which one should I pick? Well, what do you think you should pick? What are the balances on this? Then he sat with his older brother who's home who had already moved out and moved back in because his rent partner that he was with failed to pay rent and he was stuck with the whole bill. And oh, yeah, adulting is hard. Also the same kid who has tummy aches and doesn't want to go into school in the morning. Okay, fine. Are lessons interesting and engaging? The engagement and the interest uh, that are in the school setting needs to be meaningful. The very first slide I showed you is if we teach kids the way we used to, we don't have a future because we need to keep evolving. 
the same old, same old isn't going to work. So it's got to be something that they can do that's interactive. Sometimes using, you know, it used to be no phones allowed in the classroom. Now it's take your phones out. I want you to Google this, find this information. It's actually using the tool that's in their hands. Are we supporting the whole child? CDE has a program out talking about the whole child. You've got social, emotional, academic, physical. Uh, then you've also got socioeconomic. And you've got also, are they hungry? Let's just go down to the real beginning. If you're hungry and irritable, how many of you have been hangry? How many of you are those Betty Whites out there, you know, that gets tackled in the Snickers bar, right? If we feed them, then they'll be, well, I also said this rule when I was a principal. If you feed the teachers, they don't eat the children. Okay. But if you feed the children, they're going to perform better because they're able to focus and not feeling ill and less likely to be out sick. Are we educating the whole family? I, I can't tell you how much family engagement makes a difference because you're teaching the student, but what do they get when they go home? Explicatives about that blank, blank, blankety blank teacher who gave you this grade, what were they thinking, or why don't they accept this or that? It's important that they understand their communication with their child about school is just as important as ours. We can't just sell ourselves. We need to be there that they want to be with us. And do they see school as a path to their better future? Now, wasn't Eric Moore a great presenter for talking to us about what future looks like? Thank you, sir, for being here to be part of that. If we don't have a future and we're living for the now, why bother? Because nothing's going to happen tomorrow. Nothing's going to change. Life has changed for us. We, some of us that are in our 50s and plus, hmm, have learn that you need to go to school, you have to go to college in order to get a job. Now if you go to college, there's no jobs out there, so what do you do? Do you have an alternate school? Do you have an alternate program? What are you get, what's your side hustle? Because that's what all our kids are talking about, their side hustle. How many of you know about those Uber weekends for some of our teachers? Because they need to be able to pay for some of the materials. These questions are what I want you to bring back to your staff for staff meetings. I want it to be part of what they understand. They're making a difference in the students' lives. I have my contact information up here, but you should also be able to pick up a card up front. We are drawing to a close. My last slide is your exit ticket. Now, this is our survey. And the survey is asking us, what are you doing, and how can we best share this back out again? So what I'm asking for in closure is that you tell us not only what did you get from today that you can use. Will you be helpful and pass out for me? Don't pass out on the floor. Mm. Uh, what can you use from today's information um, that you can make plans that are different? Because if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Well, that means 999 times you said it again and it didn't make a difference after the first one. So what are we going to do differently? Perhaps we've helped to motivate some changes. Perhaps we've given you resources to be of assistance to you. Or perhaps you need more from us that we haven't addressed today. So that's what's on these questions. And then we're going to take that information and help it drive our focus for our next February chairs meeting for where we're going to next. And with that, I bid you adieu. And I thank you for coming in for today. Uh, Mr. Bravo, do you have any closing remarks? Okay. Okay, here it comes. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, giving us the feedback for today because that is your exit ticket. We're not letting you out unless you pass it out. You lucky folks on camera, you're going to get it and you're going to turn it into us. I'm looking at you. I have no idea who she's talking to, but just play along. No sudden moves. Um, question has uh, come up several times in my realm that kind of falls over into this realm as well, which has to do with suspension. And it's the, when do we start counting it? Now, in years past, it was kind of simple. It was very simply a district decision as to how it's counted and what. But in the days of higher accountability and chronic absenteeism, I think it, it is, there might be a better answer out there, and I'm, I'm looking for your input. So the issue is this. When you're suspending a student, and you suspend them at 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, then you count that as day one. But if you're suspending them afternoon, do you not count that as day one and then start the next day? This has been a universal question that I've had since back in the days when I was an assistant principal. 
So in other words, if you suspend a student before noon, used to be the, the, the general one was, if it's before noon, that counts as day one. And then afternoon, it doesn't count as day one, so the next day counts as a true first day of suspension. That was, again, uh, uh, not policy, not anything that was written in stone. With chronic absenteeism being uh, noted for us on the, dashboard, on the dashboard, and newer and more rigorous reporting um, uh, requirements through CalPADS, the question I put out to you is, how would that be noted? Because you're dealing with two things. You're dealing with attendance, and you're also dealing with how it's being reported out in your days of suspension. So if you have something that you, you, would, you would like to, to share on that, please uh, email me, email Marion, and then I will get that out to, the, to you all as well, because I have a couple districts that have recently asked about it, and one today in particular. But definitely, that's always been kind of a dilemma. And now I think more so than ever, with chronic absenteeism being a factor, and the way that CalPATS has gotten a lot more stringent on some things, what... Is there any requirement now that we may have to fall under that, that would be more than just division or district decides? Or is it still one of those where it kind of falls onto a district to determine how they're going to play that one out, keeping in mind the manner in which this is going to be reported out? So dwell on that. Email me. Call me. I would be happy to uh, get any and all info you have on that and how you do that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bravo. No, no. You're applauding me for giving you work. I love that. <laughs> Get out of here. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, this, this is the conclusion of our presentation for today. Uh, if you have any questions or want to stay, we're finishing a little bit early today, so thank you. Don't forget that we still have some folks at the back tables. And uh, either door you choose to go from, we'll grab your exit ticket. Thank you so much. <laughs>